all gonna be in root. It's not gonna be anything complicated. Okay, you need to shut up. My name is Russell Bates. I'm a 47-year uh, resident of Berkeley. This February, I'll be 73 years old, and I have been involved in the park for a long time, most actively since 1990. And I was arrested five times over that period of time, three times in 10 days when they first put in the volleyball court. We'd be arrested They'd take us to jail, we'd get out and come back, we'd be rearrested, taken to jail. Got out, rearrested, taken back to jail, given a stayaway order then, which is given out by the university arbitrarily to anybody they feel is gonna be a threat to law and order on the university. And uh, you know, I've seen some pretty spectacular things going on there. There used to be a parking lot on the east end of the park. Uh, a free parking lot. You know, if you got stuck against the wall, you might be there all day until the person in front came back. You get his car, you get their car, but it was free. The university decided they were going to make it a paid parking lot, at which point we got pickaxes and shovels, took it out. The Berkeley police came, the UC police came. Our communist mayor, then our two term communist mayor in Berkeley, Gus Newport. Came over and saw the Berkeley police there. He said, hey, it's not our problem. Go do something else. And the UC police, for some reason, did not want to deal with a bunch of hippies with pickaxes and shovels, angrily taking up the asphalt. So this struggle has been going on a long time for the last 50 years, and there's no reason not to perpetuate that struggle for another 50 years. We were just talking a minute ago about the potential of starting a land trust and raising the funds to buy the property outright from the university. Do you see that as a realistic? Uh... I think it's very realistic. I think it's similar to what's ha what happened to the Mothers for Housing in Oakland, mm -hmm. whose property was bought by a for a foreclosure by gentrifying landlords in their attempt to uh, prevent what I call gentricide all over the Bay Area. Now what they did, they went in and took the house back, stayed there. Landlord came in and said, no, you can't be here. Kicked him out again. But before then, hundreds of people had shown up in 15 or 20 minutes to support the mothers. And last I had heard that this negotiation was going on for the moms to actually buy the house. And it, when similar situations arise in Oakland, the people will get the first choice. So uh, why not do that in Berkeley? You know, we have an old expression that I'm not saying is good for this time around, but the last couple of times around has been, you try it, we riot. And they didn't listen the last few times. Hopefully they'll listen this time. It's not a threat, it's a promise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
Hi everyone, I'm, I'm Aiden Hill, a People's Park activist. Right now we're right in the assembly stages of our capital strategies protest. People from all different types of green spaces are coming together and we're about to do a little rally, a speak out, talk really about like why this is a bad project and how none of our voices were included in the decision making. And then we're gonna go in and uh, make sure our voices are heard. So uh, thank you. because they are the land defenders today who are like us. They're the ones who are protecting West um, Berkeley Shell Mound, who are protecting Emeryville Shell Mound, who have uh, brought back Lishan in East Oakland. And so these are our indigenous leaders, and that's why we followed their, um, the, the women leaders, Karina Gould and Janela the Rose. So that's just some information for you students, because I, I know a lot of you come from other territories that is indigenous, and you may not know that. Huchin is a Chichenya word for Berkeley and Oakland. And so, um, so with much love to the Lishan Ohlone ancestors who have, who will, and will continue to fight for the land. This is nothing new for the land. But your part is really important, not only for the land, but most important for your own life. It's important for your own life, right? And the work you do as a student is really important for all of us, that we hope that it is connected to, this, um, to the land and to the indigenous people of this land. So many thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, thank you. Thank you. People's Park, a home of the people a home of all of our intersectional issues, from housing justice to climate change and adaptation, to the needs and material conditions of marginalized people, we all found a space together in People's Park. This couldn't be possible without the tireless and unending work of our elders, those who took it upon themselves to make this land Berkeley, California, accessible for all people to have access to a future, to have access to environmental safety. 
when UC comes to you and says that they want to build student housing on sacred spaces, we have to have the courage to say no. We have no. to protect our sacred sites. We have to protect the work and the energy of all generations of people that come together. Really quickly, I'd love for Ed Monroe, a Telegraph Street artist and People's Park activist who's, on, who's been on the front lines for years defending this sovereign space. Ed. Yeah. Hello, hello. First of all, really importantly, I want to express our gratitude to all of you that are here. I am so impressed with the turnout, all of you that showed up. It really means so much to us, really. Because sometimes it looks so bleak when we're having a meeting and there's only like 10 people there and everything. And so seeing you here is just really reassuring and very makes me feel very warm. I want to thank you so much. We've got a long and difficult fight ahead of us here. Uh, and we're facing something that is like, in so many ways, is like intractable because it's so caught into money and greed and this eternal lust for development, for like th that anything that stands up for people and for justice or, or truth is, is just bowled over by this. And I've pointed this out time and again, that last year at Christmas when they destroyed those trees, they came into the park with some lie that there was something wrong with all these trees they had to get rid of Christmas before last. And the only thing that was wrong with those trees is they were in the way of large equipment. That was the only thing, because trees that would block a big old thing from getting in there were removed. You could see it with all the trees in the West End, they created a highway right through the middle of it where they can get this big equipment in. So it's a lie, and there was nothing wrong with those trees. And this is a thing that this lust for money causes people to be detached from truth. And you know what, what we're seeing in Washington, all over our nation, this corruption based on people who are just so caught up with money and developing that fraud is okay, lying is okay, and this is what we got to stand up against. And I, again, I want to thank so much of you because we have to be inspired by something else. We are all in this together. Woo. Brothers, sisters, male, female, transgender, we're all in this together. We have to fight to try to save this planet because these reckless, greedy people are blind. They don't see what they're doing. So thank you so much for showing up. Uh, I'm so grateful to all you organizers because we're really impressed. Thanks a lot. I'm Ed Monroe, and when you, we have our 51st anniversary in the park in a couple of months, I'm Lefty the Clown. I'll be the MC, most likely, if I'm still around. So, also, we do free speech there. So when you come to that park, if you have an organization or something that you want to talk about, come there at the anniversary. And we'll have a space for you and time for you to get up on stage and talk about the things you believe in. So just bear that in mind. That's what the park is about. It's about a cultural thing. There's all these different organizations that use that park over the last 50 years. Student groups, community groups, the Harry Krishnas, all kinds of people have used that park. And so it's cultural. It's a rich cultural thing. And believe me, Again, I just want to tell you how grateful I am to see all of you here. So thanks a lot. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, thank you. People's Park is the home of free speech, of your constitutional right of assembly. Even the artistic nature of the park is held in our First Amendment rights. It, it has to be said that the university is an all-out war against free speech in the sense that they're trying to take away your right to gather, your right to have a clean environment. In their future, they imagine you going to school and then to work and then maybe in your bed in a room full of four people for the rest of your tenure at UC Berkeley. The housing that they plan doesn't encourage us to be independent 
free-minded people. Instead, it accuses us of wanting to be robots, trying to do nothing more than get A's and then make our way out of there only to funnel our money back into the university. We can't forget that Mario Savio was defending the right of People's Park activists to have access to a free space, and that he believed that students, faculty, and communities together should have the right to govern this university instead of rich Whigs who simply control all the means of production in California and want to turn this into a center of artificial intelligence. Instead, I position to you, together, we should make all of UC Berkeley a people's park. Woo!
between April of 2000, in April of 2018, the east side of the park, UC decimated 42 healthy trees. We've got photos on the table, so you can see, you can see, you can see, I mean, you can see where it was in April 2018 and what they did, sorry, nine months later. It's hot, all these trees are gone, it's hot, people have lost some of the shelter during the rain. It's just cruelty. UC tries to, you know, do whatever they can to smash people down. And so they keep doing it, but we keep rising back up. And it's really great to get together with a lot of Oxford track people, a lot of Gill track people, and just go, we're all in it together. They're trying to rob us of our connection to the earth. Thank you, Max. So I think it's time we give UC a piece of our mind. Who's university? Continue to build and build until just 
come in action. Their policies in which they take our community members out with their stay away orders, their policies in which they stop our students from learning with their over tuition costs, their lack of food security, and you believe that People's Park has helped you, please make your voice known. You have the right to speak. Hello. This is a letter from the students of Berkeley to follow the strategies in the Chancellor's office. We, the students of the University of California at Berkeley, are writing in defense of People's Park and in response to your plans for its development. Across Berkeley, you carry out plans to build market rate housing on our educational, research, and public spaces. The very spaces that are working to address the basic needs of students, rather than supporting student-led programs that address food, housing, and financial insecurity, you move forward with the only solution that you seem to have in your playbook. Real estate development. Given the many alternative sites and community-based solutions that this group is pioneering and putting forward, these development projects reveal your true goal not of making housing that is affordable or accessible, but of making a return on an investment. Your relentless push to build on People's Park, Oxford Tract, and quote, all the land that we have, repeatedly has repeatedly attempted to establish a false dichotomy between sites for housing and our sites for education, for research, and public space. We believe that by building meaningful and cooperative decision-making structures, that center students, faculty, staff, and community alike. We can create a future that sustains environmental justice, housing, food security, research, public space, and community engagement. Come on! And the history of People's Park is a testament to the myth that further capital development will solve housing insecurity. The university has built thousands of units in downtown Berkeley since it acquired the park in 1967, but houselessness remains, the crisis remains. You are using the crisis, manufactured in part by your 30% enrollment hike, to justify your actions that simply strengthen your role as a landlord. You have created a series of task force, committees, and reports that we have read thoroughly, and none of them offer a guarantee or even a definition of affordability. In fact, you are proposing an external financing for this project that will inevitably be offset by student rents. Undergraduates could report paying higher monthly rents in university-owned housing than non-university-owned housing. We envision a different future for People's Park, a future that uplifts affordable housing, campus food security, social services, regenerative land management, community-engaged research, and political education. People's Park is the site of numerous organizations, student groups, and social services. Oh, gotta turn the page. Yeah! We out of here, people. At its core, the development of People's Park is not simply an issue of housing, as your plan would have us believe. The future of this land has implications for how Berkeley's community envisions public space, public education, and public welfare. To create a vision that actually addresses the crisis at hand, the students of UC Berkeley must be included. The students of UC Berkeley demand a more inclusive, equitable, and collaborative decision-making process and how the university utilizes its land resources. And we have a list of demands here. Please, please, thank you so much. All right, for all of you cronies in the room, because when you look around, the only students in here are the ones standing in this circle. We got a bunch of capitalist developers around us. We don't actually have the students and the community members here who this park is supposed to be for, who this development is supposed to be for, and who the park is actually for. So to all you in the room, listen to our demands. We call for a moratorium on any further development planning until the following demands are met. Formally acknowledge that UC Berkeley is built on unseen and lonely territory. And we include lonely leadership in the writing of your long-range development plan. Two, commit to protecting student-led educational, research, and public spaces, including People's Park, 
talking about prison and torture. We have 600% more women prisoners than the world's average. Not only the time to kill, but the to torture. The one family is just hundreds of us out there, and they put the lives down to the grid. They move them, they kick you. There was hundreds of people. You couldn't even move your face, but they kick you and hit you with a baton. And these were people who trusted the enemy. In Alameda County, and the local police are still torturing us. We come to People's Park, breathe the air, smile, lift up their spirits. Woo! Don't want to participate with the people that they're trying to build upon. Why is it that they can feel so comfortable in their time? and their suits, and their degrees, but they don't want to engage the community. The reality is, is that if you were honest about what you wanted to do, and make sure that this community is safer, there wouldn't be this division between us. They would simply listen to the people and say, you don't want building on people's park. We're done. But we know it's going to be a fight. And that's why we have to make our voices known. Because they are here to silence you. They are here to make sure that your opinions fade off into the distance, like they have done to me, like they have done to many of us in the People's Park community. And at worst, this university conducts slap suits, strategic legal action lawsuits, really. And what they do with those is they say, if you are on our property, because you carried a sign, or you said incendiary words, you will not have access to the community. And for some people, that is life or death. For some people, if they don't get food, not bombs, that is life or death. For some people, if they don't have access to shade, because they don't have high walls over them, that is equivalent to death. And so we have to realize that this university is now participating in climate skepticism, climate denial. There is no difference between this chancellor who keeps saying build, build, build on people's park and Donald Trump in the White House. We have to acknowledge that both of them believe that property belongs to a select few with the consequence of the many. And so please consider that and really ask them, in their wisdom of chancellorship and administrative roles, to talk about why building on green space in an already dense area is not ecocide. The reality is, it is dead. So, we get a request from uh, Chancellor Carol Chris somewhere who wants to speak and tell you about why this is so important to her. I mean, this is a chancellor that came in 2017 and had the idea that kicking out poor people has somehow going to help the student community. So, Chancellor Carol Chris, if you're around, if not, if not, I mean, it would just be enough performance to not be here, right? <laughs>
Uh, how did you guys get selected to do the supportive housing project at People's Park? So, so my name is Dan Soslack. I'm the executive director of mm -hmm. Resources for Community Development. We're a nonprofit housing developer, so we build. And then, and then we operate affordable housing. We operate it for working families, for people coming from homelessness, for elders, um, you know, people with disabilities. And we are in Berkeley. We've been here since 1984. And um, basically, um, we felt that um, this was a, a development that um, was going to happen. And. Um, the supportive housing was critically necessary. Um, you know, there's basically 8,000 now homeless folks in Alameda County. It's doubled in the last two years. And uh, we felt like it was important that we um, put our hat in the ring, so to speak, to, to do this. The, the, what affordable, quote, affordable housing does is it sets rents that are you know, matching basically 30% of the income of the residents of those, of those units. So um, they, some of those folks may have jobs, some of them probably will be on, on SSI, some of them may have very little or, or no income. Um, it's, not, it's not without rent, right? I mean, you have to, you know, that's what the federal government makes us all do, so people will be asked to pay, but generally it will be about 30% of their, their income. From, from my perspective, um, I will say that I think that there's a lot of value in what they've done to help homeless people and help low-income people. They did not have to do that, and the fact that that's something that is part of what they're doing and they could, they would, you know, it is is significant. We really feel strongly that supportive mm -hmm. housing is important, and this is an opportunity to build more supportive housing. And we hope that people understand that our primary goal is to house people who are coming from homelessness. Thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate this opportunity. Face this percentage. What would, what would be the percentage of open space after all the buildings? It's a really good question. We don't have designs yet. We, our architect is here, he's working on that now. And any, next any, month... Any, any sense for what? Greg. In your... Greg is our architect. And we're expecting to have three or four design options in a month. And so please come back and you can see the different design options that we have. But right now, it's still... In any any, any ballpark of some of the ocean of what percentage would be uh, open space? I think in the earlier proposal, there was always like one third, one third, one third. But it's like one third supportive housing, one third open space, one third safe housing. But what's the default? We don't know exactly what's the default. Can we do better? That would be the, the goal to see how we can do the trade off in high density versus open space. Right. And, and would have. the open space um, in any of these? Contemplated uh, configurations be readily available for, uh, for, for the public to access, or would, be, or would they be largely in a courtyard space? Those are all the, questions. That, all questions that, that there's going to be design options, and you get to come in and say what you want it to be. We're not none there of, yet. None of those things have been decided right now. Right. We honestly no. do not have an answer to that question. Right. And that's, well, that's why I'm asking the questions. The no, questions no, no, no. are the ones I'm asking. I'm the publisher of the People's Pocket. So the last site that we have some, some activity on that we're supposed to be able to create stage is Oxford Craft. The one that's currently been for like 60 years is agricultural. Right. That's right. Yeah. And, that? and we are... That's between, it's between um, Walnut Street at Oxford, bounded okay. by uh, Virginia okay. and um, University of So that project is further out because it has a university use, so we are studying whether or not it's feasible to relocate that site. But we're studying it, and we haven't gotten very far in that process yet. Okay. But those are the projects that have some current traction, and that have some work being done on them. So where are we at right now? We have uh, Blackwell Hall has been delivered. Right. And then we're hoping, we're hoping to have, we're hoping to have the mixed use apartments uh, given to us this fall. Right now it's probably mid-fall, so it won't be ready before the start of the semester uh, in the fall, but we're hoping that it, it gets delivered by mid to late September, early October.
um, in 2021, if we can get the lawsuit settled, we'll start construction on Upper Hearst, and that one will be delivered in 2021, 2022, depending on how much longer that takes. Uh, Gateway and People's Park, 2024, the soonest we can get that done. So when would you have to have the financing for that? And then Oxford Track, probably 2025, 2026. When the financing for People's Park, something that we're going to be planning once the EIR is done, but the EIR, it's a year out, easily. So why did the developer that was, was going to do People's Park? It didn't fall through. We made a choice that we were going to develop it ourselves and each one of the sites are being evaluated separately and distinctly. So we will use whichever delivery model makes sense based on that site and our financing ability in that moment. Where is the mixed use apartments? Because well, if you have private uh, financing and donor uh, financing, you might not be able to control that. That's not fair to tell. So, um, affordability. Can you repeat the question? Yeah, actually, I don't know that I can completely. Com yeah, but <laughs> her question is about housing affordability and how do you maintain affordability for student housing. And it's actually not in my workload to do housing affordability. It's a different division that works on the operations of the, of the units themselves and how our entire portfolio is sort of cross-subsidized. So money that comes in from one helps to subsidize another and some of them have much more debt than others and so the operating costs, you know, have union employees, everybody gets paid a fair and living wage, everyone has a, you know, a pension and health care benefits and so our costs are kind of high. Um, in comparison, um, but that's good, right? It's important for us to have really great I love employees. because I'm from the Netherlands. Uh, Where health everybody health has health care and everybody has a retirement system. And, and universities cost $2,000. Yeah. I know, it, it's different and people pay 60% yeah. of their income in taxes. No. What do they pay? 52 is the highest, uh, but most of it is the, in the 39% range. My brother-in-law is from Sweden and it's 16. Yeah, but, that's, yeah, it's and, not the but they also enough. paid less than 2000 to go to college, so you know, there you go. They paid more than that under Eisenhower, so it's kind of like whatever. I know, 90% <laughs> under Eisenhower taxes. Sorry, yeah. let's get back to this. Sorry, Sorry, yeah. this. So these are the projects that we have on the way right now. So where are we housing progress being made? Um, if we were to build at the highest amount at every single site that I've just told you about, we have between 3,700 and 6,000 beds. And so if our goal is 8,800, you can see that even with these sites, we're not all the way there and we have to look at other sites. Or stop increasing enrollment past the agreement with the city. That you guys well, you know, that's actually a really <laughs> good point. Yeah, we don't get to choose how many students the regions decide how many students to enroll, and they push down and they tell us we will enroll this. I'm sure, you Your can question. get that. Based off of uh, limits, zoning laws. So these are sort of our early estimates, but the long range development plan and the campus master plan will be evaluating each of these sites and telling us how many beds we actually propose to get on each of these sites. So that's something that we're in the midst of right now. So we get to 8,800 beds, and now Greg can tell you a little bit about where we are with this specific project. So uh, I'm Greg, I'm with Letty Mame, Stacy Architects. So this is kind of the project timeline of where we're at. So today is our first kind of open house uh, listening session. That's kind of all the way over here on the far left. This is gonna be one of three. Uh, we're gonna have another uh, open house in about a month from now, kind of early March, and then another in April. Uh, those are, the second one will be about kind of options and concept development. And we'll bring as, as um, Michelle mentioned, like three or four options with you. We don't yet know what they're gonna be about. And then uh, the last one, number three, will be kind of the final option, kind of the preferred option, and how kind of building upon everything we've heard today and kind of all the kind of conversations that we have. And then there'll be another public meeting in 2021 kind of in parallel with the environmental review that you heard Michelle talk about. That's kind of the top row. And the bottom row is kind of where we are. We haven't started designing, kind of working in that. But that third meeting is gonna address what? The, 
Like that's when the we one hear, that, that's when we hear from the second comments mm -hmm. and when we hear the options. Mm -hmm. So we'll develop the options at meeting two, and then we'll kind of report back what we heard from those options from those comments, and then we'll kind of present the final option based upon what we hear at the second meeting. The program. So what goes on the site? I think you've heard all uh, different parts and pieces, but just to kind of outline it here, on the far right, student housing is kind of a main component. 950 to 1200 beds for uh, undergraduate and graduates, still kind of getting worked out from sophomore, junior, senior. Uh, supportive housing, 75 to 125 apartments. Uh, for the formerly homeless residents being developed by RCD. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to go talk to them over there, uh, Alicia's really great. She can give you a lot of information about what supportive housing is if you don't know about it. And then also uh, an open space. And an open space that's gonna be safe and welcoming and really building upon the legacy of the park and what it means. So the, the goals of the project, um, we have five big goals. Uh, we want to address the student housing needs. We've kind of stuck through the whole presentation about uh, that student housing crisis. Provide desperately needed housing, homeless housing, and supportive housing. We want to re revitalize the neighborhood and offer improved safety. We want to address crime uh, at the campus level and in the city level. And lastly, we want to honor um, the memory and meaning of People's Park. And again, if you haven't had a chance to engage with the timeline that's kind of behind you, that talks about kind of the history of People's Park and even before the park. Really encourage you to go talk to Alma and Grace that are over there. Um, but you, you, you do realize <laughs> that yeah, they'll give you a real good among history. a significant section of Berkeley's population, there is a deep well of distrust that the university, which has been so adamantly opposed to the very ideal of People's Park since its first inception and has been a dogged opponent of the use of that. You do realize that in this trust that the university in concert with developers should be the custodian of a legacy they sought to destroy arouses deep, deep suspicion among a very significant cohort of the population. I, I completely understand so that. So you have to answer the question publicly. What, why should we trust that the university as an institution even understands what the legacy of a park they did so much to destroy and in concert with police forces in the state of California led to the death of one man, the blinding of another, and as myself and my fellow participants in the building of that park can attest, the arrest of so many of us. Okay. And the, so that is a main question that sure. has to be answered. Okay. So if I heard you correctly, how does the university understand the legacy of the park? I just want to be clear that that. that That's one part of it. So, and why should be the, they and be why the sole they... repository and be the custodian of that legacy? It would be as if in the creation of a museum about slavery in this country, we should grant to the plantation owners the right to be the custodian of that legacy. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a fair question. It yeah. is, and I think that that's part of what this process is about. We're asking you guys to tell us what should be commemorated. And, and we are going through a process. We met with a group of park activists and we heard very clearly from them their grief, their pain. And I think that that's what part of this process is. It's to uncover that and to talk about it. I'm not saying that we should be the only owners of that legacy, but I am saying that we need to document it in some way. There's no doubt that this is a, an opportunity for a healing process. And we've heard a lot about healing. <laughs> This is not. This is a wounding process, guys. Yeah, this is a total I, I, I assault think the language of therapy yes. is wholly inadequate to the uh, predicament that you find yourself in. And if I can say so, um, this assumes, perhaps correctly, that some sort of structures are all but a fait accompli. There is no option on the table not to build anything on the park, but rather to double us. down 
on the park itself. So for some of us, it's a little bit like developers and an institution suggesting, hey, you know what, that battlefield of Gettysburg, why don't we turn it into a mall? Yeah, we'll have a plaque, yeah. but some significant portion of it in order to respond to the consumer's desires now that we should, uh, and then let's talk about what that might mean given the fact that Lincoln stood up and gave a imperishable speech there. So for some of us, the one option that might be appealing and that would recognize the responsibility that the university had in destroying the hopes and even a life and the blind even other took place would be to take this particular parcel off the table. Yeah. But that is not what, it, what the university is being proposing. Rather, they're suggesting that we be complicit in a so-called dialogue conversation so that we can heal and move on. For some of us, the wound is still, despite the passage of five decades, raw. Raw as if we were the veterans of a civil war that took place. And for the university, which has a pedagogical mission of trying to transfer historical memory to its charges, the idea that it should bulldoze into oblivion, albeit with a nod to a plaque and a bit of greenery, this, for what is some of us, a bit of land stained with our own blood, is a cause for shame. And we want to hold you and the university to account. But that's not what's on the table. I think those are fair comments that you can make. I don't disregard that. And what I can assure you is that the university, despite its institutional desire to make sure that the rest of us finally have either been enfeebled by age and our bodies betraying us so that we are a wheelchair brigade of protesters, the university has an ace in its deck, which is to outlive us all. And once the memory of it is forgotten, it banks on the historical amnesia of its students, of its architects, and of its faculty in order to betray its essential mission, which is to actually safeguard a history which is now being, as I say, bulldozed into oblivion. So this is a principle state, and I just want to say as a prophetic voice, you are risking a lot. You are risking a lot. And the trust of, the, of this institution with its citizens is hanging in the balance for some of us. Not all of us, but for some of us. And you need to think deeply, deeply about this. You will expect there will be civil disobedience, I hope, peaceful, because the violence came from the state back in 1969. I remember it vividly. You, people will be arrested. People will put their bodies online. The 47 trees that were cut down a year ago in September, under the idea of kind of pruning the plot. What I predict is that under cover of night, as has been historically the case with the university, they will come in with bulldozers, they will dig, they will dig a pit, they will start, they will set up a police perimeter, and they will keep the protesters confined to their wheelchairs and their canes. And their voices will not really make much of a difference. So I have a very dark and foreboding view of this process, but I'm not at all comforted by the therapy of words to get us to buy in to a process whose conclusion is all but foreordained. I just want you to, and this will be on your head, you will have to sleep with yourself. Understood. I think, I, I think so these I just, are all you know, acknowledged comments and we've heard these comments. I know, I'm trying to put it as eloquently and as yeah. carefully as I can well done, with definitely. respect so that if there's any among you who want to think deeply about the mission of the university, of the work that you do, despite the conceit of this being done for the homeless and for the students who desperately need housing, uh, a predicament we all acknowledge, but why this piece of land, so stained with struggle and our own blood, should be chosen, I don't think the university quite understands the depth of the insult. If they do, it's really, that's uh, really saying something about the leadership. <laughs> Let's presume they want the best the for everybody. I have a question. So, like
like you guys need more housing, right? But if you drive along the Bay Area, there's at least hundreds of empty apartment buildings that just no one can afford. So they just sit there completely empty. But you guys find it a necessity to build on a park for more housing when there is probably just enough housing, people just can't afford it. That's yeah, they're not going to be able to afford this one either. <laughs> and, and we have examples in Berkeley where city partnerships with land have created par parks like the Ohlone Park, which had been the People's Park uh, secondary park along Hearst, you know, which does not have the, the whole the whole thing of crime and 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 all of that is a, is a bogus issue. It is Absolutely. a result of the neglect of five decades. If the city had will, and if the university had desire, much could be done to preserve and strengthen the existing park and to solve all the social problems, or at least to lance the boil of anxiety that some people in the neighborhood may feel and others in the city may feel um, without building the much needed student housing on that particular postage stamp size piece of land. May I say, as long as Willard is mentioned, where do you think the homeless are going to move? Exactly. Willard Park. A school zone. Do you, do you that's think, where it's going to be. Right. There's 2,000 homeless people and you're going to add 100 shelter beds. That makes so much sense. We're not adding shelter beds. Okay, you're adding Support. beds for a homeless people. Support, if you care about housing. where the homeless sleep, you'd let us sleep there now. Right. So that's a problem. And it, once again, we were pretending like there's not enough housing when there is, just like that people can't afford it. I didn't mean to take away from No, that's all right. I said my piece. Well, well I would just like to say at a time like this in our history, to take the part when fascism is on the rise all over the world and in our country, to take a park that was born from dissent, you know, people that stood up to take our park when it should be there to remind people, you know, that there were courageous people that stood up to people like Trump that can't anymore because they're mired in debt, they're scared to get a job. The atmosphere is so changed that the park is that much more necessary. And the, and guy, the guy who started this whole Reagan. I mean, what we have in Washington now is a direct descendant of Reagan. That's which is, right. And where Reagan sharpened his teeth on kicking people out of the park. Exactly. And he was foaming at the mouth on the 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, just hating the students. Is there any more to the vision? You're in that slide. That is the slide. There's one more slide. There's a few more slides. Um, this is just, obviously, many of you know the park. This is just to acknowledge the park's 2.8 acres. It has three main zones in the park. It has a grove of trees kind of towards the east. It has, call it a, a field in the middle, the open space in the middle. They'll have the basketball court. Kind of a different zone, the center, the center of the park. And then towards the west is the garden, kind of the garden side of the park. So just to, And it has also different neighbors uh, different sides of the park, but also important to talk about. There's obviously the telegraph side, the commercial district of the park. There's a the north side of the park that's more the university, kind of closer to the university, has Anahead uh, over there at Maxima Martinez, other additional student housing. To the east is uh, more kind of institutional uses with First Church and the Mandata Society, kind of a different neighborhood, neighbors. And then to the south is the more residential kind of side where Willard Park is kind of moving to the south. So it's kind of an interesting location in the city of different different neighborhoods or sub-neighborhoods of, of Berkeley. And so when you just think about that uh, of its place in the city. <coughs> These are just again just some views of the park. give the, the character of the park and for people who are you know we're, we're not we're here having a meeting and we're not we're not we're not in the park we just want to talk about it as a place so we feel like we need to show some photos of the park so we all remember that it's a park it's the view from the south the right way looking across the park towards Anahead towards Mexico 
new housing is being built, density is changing, but they're still the, the center of the park. The view from Bowditch. Bowditch is a different street. Dwight, Bowditch, and Hayes are all different characters. Dwight is a one-way street. Hayes is a one-way street. Bowditch is a two-way street. It's a bike lane. And the grove of trees on Bowditch are different. I see. And have a different oh, yeah. character to that street. Again, with First Church being also an important building. Yeah, very uh, important. And making these blocks when you build in the park is going to block beautiful What did you saw an engineer told me it's going to flood the businesses on Telegraph when they fill in all yeah, the soil. Yeah, what do you think is going to happen to the homeless at the People's Park? Do you think we're just going to magically disappear to La La Land? By the, by the way, our last picture was a great oh. picture of where our hate man used to live. Before the university started kicking him out. I love him. And then he died like two years ago. Did anybody mention the tree that, that actually did fall down and kill somebody like three days after yeah, they the cut grape. the supposedly dangerous trees? That supposedly dangerous, yes. Meanwhile, they're letting the tree that actually is about to fall and kill somebody kill somebody. Just hang out. You know, it's like there's so much double dealing and bad faith at the university. The they don't even care about building kids. Right. We don't know if you want to build there. You just want to kick us out. That's all we know for sure. The, the next slide is from View from Hay Street, looking across. Can we pretend that it was because the trees are dangerous when it was actually so you could look at people and surveil people much easier? And that's why all the shrubs and trees were cut down. I don't. I doubt it's because the trees are dangerous. The, all the trunks are healthy. You can look at the rings. They cut how many rings? How many? 2,000 new rings of trees. Were you guys at the meeting where you decided to cut the trees? Uh, it's another department. You see who you're working with? Your you, you see who these people are? I'm, these I'm are with Buddy Mayhem Stacy Architects. These are the biggest criminals in California, the Board of Regents, the heads of the corporations. Blum, no, the LUM. Not part of the university. They're going. milking the cow up here. What are you just telling me? No, I appreciate it. Yeah. A, a woman retired from the chancellor's office. So she I told me they told Capital Projects, you will not get the $500,000 to build at the tree set site and the earthquake stadium. And they spend it anyway. $500 million, nobody went to jail for that. But that we have six times more women prisoners in the world and then than the average and you get tortured out here in our county jail with our UCPD arresting people. On the I, I, I do not want to talk over people, so I'm just going to wait until they're done talking. I want to show people the respect. I, I'm here till 8 o'clock tonight, so I, I understand if you want to speak. This is a day for listening, so I really want to give you the opportunity to listen. So I'm not going to, I really honestly won't talk over anyone. So Thank you. please, uh, I'm, I'm happy to hear. So, and again, for part of the intent for today is really to listen. I understand there's, um, this is our chance. And I know there's, we heard a lot already right now and we want to capture the information as best as we can. Um, there around us, there's different exercises. There's uh, the left over here, the kind of one word exercises. Um, these were about um, talking to us about the opportunities, the aspirations for the site, uh, what the site could be for the city of Berkeley. What the, oh, sorry. No, no, come this way. What the, what, the, what the site could be for the for the city, for the university, or for yourself. Um, also, to want to hear about um, the benefits that the project might bring to the community. What what might the benefits be? Again, there's multiple parts to think about this project. Supportive housing, open space, student housing. And then a lot about the concerns. No. We want to, we want to hear the no's. There's a way, a chance for us to record it. So we can come back to you in a month and share with you what we heard. I guess the first thing I would like to hear, the only possible benefit for starters, and I have yet to hear it, is a formal apology from the chancellor or the regents for the past actions they took in 1969 and in the five decades that brought us to this place. I have never heard an apology for either the killing of James Rector or the blinding of Alan Blanchard or the arrests of dozens, if not scores, of people during those two weeks in, the, in, in May of 1969. I'd like to hear an apology. Once there's an apology that's made, then maybe there can be some consideration of a conversation. 
but until they show the minimal respect for the community whose solicitude they would like and whose respect we are enjoined to give to a project which, if we're to believe the university, is done in good faith in order to resolve the predicament that its students are facing and will be facing in the future. The barest minimum is an apology. We have not got that yet. I would suggest you go to your minders and tell them that it will cost them nothing but might gain them a modicum of trust, which now, sadly, is sorely lacking among many of us. One step at a time. One step at a time. The way you move, you're tilting the playing field. That should not be concerns. That should be detriments. That should be detriments. We're not concerned. It's going to impact us negatively. It's, it's benefits. The cost is balanced against detriments. And we're not talking how much money, we're talking about how it services our community. Are you ready for the amount of people that's going to fight back? Are you ready for all the people that's going to get arrested? Are you ready for the people that are going to fly in just to fight back against you guys? And people are going to do a lot of stuff. <laughs> We've heard that too. We are hearing all of these different perspectives. Did I, 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 I carry out to you, uh, we present the jury, I want to say 2011, talk to you about the ball for the students here kind of got together to have it occupy designed to, to yeah. No, actually it wasn't. I mean, we've been here for about a year and a half. You know, I, I would just recommend if uh, you just find any kind of look at what that looked like and, 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 and the amount of discord that caused between the university and the students and just how much you kind of serve as a detriment to your own community, your own sense of cohesion as a school. And as a, it was a big deal. There was plenty of degree, plenty of hours. <laughs> last slide. This is a, a list of who we've been going to meet with. Uh, we've uh, on, on these kind of listening sessions. There's also a hard copy kind of there to the right. If you want to come spend more time and look in the list, that's also an opportunity on that board to share with us if there's other folks that we should be going to uh, speak with. Where's that board? Uh, and there's a uh, room for post-its to put information. Uh, we met with the graduate assembly last week. Tomorrow we're meeting with the Student Advisory Council, so um, financial aid. and financial aid. Um, and next week we're going to meet with the ASU Division. And the week after that we're meeting with the uh, Res Hall Advisors Council so, for Residence Hall. Okay. Again, if there's folks that you don't see in this list but that you want to have that list, please put it on there. Mm -hmm. So there are many different stations around around the room, and we're looking for your feedback. Comments, so please interact with them. Give us your comments. Write us. Write down what it is you want us to know. Serves a really important time, purpose, and time savings for those of us meeting. The Arab Spring wouldn't have happened without Career Square and Tiananmen Square. They're places where. The, the ruling class, the forces that are behind, you know, most of the corporate, you know, corruption, can't chase everybody out if this is true public space. And the media can let the world know that people are rising up. That's one thing I don't think the university is going to consider as, as, you know, anything positive in their role. But there's also the gathering space after a, a natural catastrophe. Yeah. That came up in our, in our group was how are we considering um, resilience? And I, I think that's a that's a I think important question to, to and I think that would be good to to write down. I think there is an opportunity for us to think about community resilience because right. because because the city is considering three more twelve-story buildings. Well, I mean, I just think that the accidents happen. The earth, you could look at the you know the. There's going to be an earthquake in, in our lifetime, likely, and so I think that's worth uh, One place where you won't have bricks on your head, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs>